Good morning! Would you like to buy this $900 iPhone that still has a 60 hertz display? Uh... It seems kind of steep, Tim. Well, what if I told you for only $3 more a month, you could actually upgrade to the 14 Pro Max with a far better camera system, beautiful dynamic island, and 120 hertz, plus an always-on display. Okay, I, I I guess that one would probably be the better deal. It's only $3 more a month. Yeah, I, I think most people could do that. That's great! And how would you like a MacBook that looks like it's six years old with a slightly faster chip for only $1,500? 15... I... Yeah, again, t that just doesn't sound like that great a deal. But hey, what if I told you for only $200 more you could get a MacBook with 120Hz mini-LED a notch, a way faster chip, and legacy ports? Well, uh, okay, yeah. Actually, that one sounds a bit more reasonable. I think I would rather have that one. That's great! And how would you feel about a cheap iPad with a home button for $300, but it has a pretty good iPhone chip in it? Yeah, I'll take that one. I want that one. What, you... <sighs> But you haven't heard the other option yet. Don't care. An iPad's an iPad. I'll just take the cheapest one you got. What if I told you there was 120 hertz on a more expensive option? Still an iPad, Tim. It's not gonna work. <sighs> okay. Well, can you at least get a keyboard case with this iPad? <laughs> All right, let's begin. I don't think it's a coincidence that Apple has a far more complex lineup than they used to. I mean, we're seeing it more and more regularly when it comes to the Mac line, the iPad line, even the iPhone line now. There are just objectively worse and worse options, despite the fact that the lineups have technically never had better options, but there's just always this, like, awkward, red-headed stepchild, I can make that joke, that exists in the lineup that all YouTubers love to tell you not to buy and don't fall for this one or definitely don't buy this one. And I I think it's because Apple genuinely has, like, psychologists full-time testing out the waters for how people spend their money when you present a certain number of options. And I think they wouldn't be doing this unless it actually proved to work. Because you notice that, okay, we've got a pretty strong, pretty impressive MacBook line, but for some reason, at $1,300, they keep wanting to sell that 13-inch MacBook Pro. It gets awfully close, especially once you spec it up to have more storage and more RAM, because, you know, you'd like your read and write speeds to be better than the M1 MacBook Pro, suddenly it's very, very close in price to the 14-inch MacBook Pro, which is just almost objectively better in every single way, whether it be the keyboard for a lot of people, the speakers, the display, the ports, the chip. So I think Apple realizes that this decoy effect is true and effective. You present someone with not too great an option, and then for a little bit more, justify, well, this actually is way, way better for only this much more, and time after time after time, that is likely convincing a lot of people to spend more money than they would have ordinarily if that decoy was not there. If they just walked into the store or opened up the website and realized that, oh, there's a really good MacBook Pro, but it's like $1,800 or $2,000, yeah, that's uh, that's a bit pricey. That's kind of hard to justify. But if you walk in and you know, okay, this one's $1,300 or $1,500, and you go, okay, that's kind of pretty close to the pricing I want, so you know, the product basically can kick its foot in the door to your mental battle with the wallet, right? You see that low price and you're like, huh, okay, 1300 or 1500 somewhere in there, I think I can justify. But then you see the features and the product's foot is already in the door. So you're already thinking about committing to that price point, but you're finding out that the display is not too good. You're finding out that the design is kind of dated or you watch a YouTube video, find out that the chip is not much faster or better than a cheaper model or last year's model. But then you see the certified refurbished or you see the on-sale 14-inch MacBook Pro and go, well, that one's clearly way better. It's got the dynamic range I want, it's got the ports I want, and a way faster chip, so that business pitch, I think, has started infiltrating more areas of Apple's business. It really is pretty obvious with the MacBook line, especially with the new M2 MacBook Air. A lot of people saying, you know, for the price, you're really so close to being able to afford a 14-inch MacBook Pro, and that's a better product, so I don't think Apple cares whether or not you're buying the 13-inch MacBook Pro or the MacBook Air. Ultimately, they just want you to spend more money total on whatever the Apple product is. So when they realize that the narrative that YouTubers and the media is pushing is just save up a little bit more or justify spending a tad more on a MacBook Pro, Apple ultimately gets more revenue out of that. And I think we're now seeing it with the iPhone 14 line as well, based on the 14 Plus not particularly selling too great and based on early data that Quo is reporting, the iPhone 14 Pro series is selling really, really 
well. In fact, better than Apple was anticipating because they're having to crank up orders and even shut down some of the assembly lines for the regular iPhone 14 so that they can ramp up and prioritize the pros. Which, honestly, when you look at the lineup, is not too big a surprise, right? Because, while yes, Apple has had a lot of success with the cheaper flagship, whether it be the 10R or the 11, there's technically never been a closer price gap between the pros and the non-pros. Now that the 14 Plus has entered the picture and the unlocked price is $929, same storage as the iPhone 14 Pro that starts at $999, so there's less than a $100 gap between getting the Pro, which has the updated Dynamic Island, which has the far better camera, which has the shinier chassis, it has the always-on display, it has the 120 hertz, and I think Apple knows going into this, like, they had to be aware the media and YouTubers and everyone was going to be talking about how insanely similar the iPhone 14 was to the 13. I mean, in the video of Tim Cook unveiling the iPhone, he wasn't even that excited for that initial launch of the non-pros. He's just like, yeah, let's take a look at the new iPhones, I guess. So let's take a look at the new iPhone. <laughs> As far as year-over-year -year differences go, this may be one of the smallest, most incremental years they've ever had between the camera arrangement hasn't been changed, the chassis really hasn't been changed, even the chip is still technically based on the A15, and they just beef up the GPU core and the RAM a little bit, but they know that the everyday consumer isn't gonna care about that kind of thing. They're just gonna hear A15 chip and think, oh, it's the same as last year, and maybe not even that. But because Apple realizes the media was gonna be pushing so hard for iPhone 14 isn't that different. I don't think anyone should buy the 14. They know that that's automatically going to push a lot of eyes and attention towards the 14 Pros because ultimately they're priced fairly reasonably. They're not that much more expensive and there's just so much more to talk about when it comes to the design, the display, the camera, the features. I mean, honestly, as small as an upgrade as people like to consider the iPhone 14, it's going to be a pretty rare thing with any year-over-year -year upgrade where you can genuinely tell that you have the new iPhone just just by looking at the front of the screen. You know, it's pretty difficult to do that with the iPhone 12 to the iPhone 13 because it's just a slightly tweaked notch. But the dynamic island, I think, stands out quite a bit more. So just that that first glance, you know, you can just briefly get one second look at the 14 Pro and know exactly this is the new iPhone, this is the latest generation. That, I think, separates it a lot from the regular iPhone 14s for not too much more money. So maybe part of the reason Apple was comfortable with the 14 Plus launching later which I joked about in a previous skit, but I think there's a lot of truth to it. Maybe Apple knew from the beginning the 14 Plus didn't need to be that big a deal because they knew the price would likely scare away a lot of people and they didn't prioritize it during the production ramp and that's why they delayed the launch till October because they just need to essentially let people know that the 14 Plus exists in order for a bunch of people to say, yeah, the 14 Pro is the better deal. It's less than $200 to opt to the 14 Pro Max, less than $100 to opt to the 14 Pro, which is a far more noticeable upgrade and probably one that's going to last a lot longer because people can see a 16 chip or better battery life. And I think I'm even seeing the decoy effect play into the Apple Watch line. If you consider the Series 8 was, in my opinion, one of the smallest upgrades Apple has ever done. Basically just gained car crash detection and some cycle tracking features with body temperature sensing, not quite checking. But what they did was introduce a brand new category, the Ultra, which only costs about $50 more than the stainless steel version of the Series 8. So, in the past, one of the main motivating factors with going with a higher-end Apple Watch, not an aluminum version, but a steel one, was simply because, yes, it did look a little nicer and sleeker, but also the glass was infused with sapphire, so it usually aged way, way better than the basic Ion X glass they use on the aluminum Apple Watches. At least, that's why I know a lot of people opt for the steel watches, but now that durability argument gets to be pushed a little bit further because the Ultra, which is of course titanium and bigger and has the action button, better battery life, and all these great features, only costs about $50 more than the stainless steel Series 8. So I think there's a bunch of people now that were maybe thinking in the past, I'm just gonna go with a steel Apple Watch because, you know, that's where I get the more durable glass and the titanium ones are cool but they cost so much more and they don't really do anymore. Whereas now the Ultra, I think, will just a 
justify a lot of people spending way more on their Apple Watch than they did before. So maybe not to the same extent as the 14 Plus or the 13 inch MacBook Pro, but I do think that stainless steel Series 8 is kind of the decoy of you're so close to being able to afford an Ultra. Why don't you just go all the way, spend a little bit more, and you'll be there at the better and best battery life Apple Watch. And I think Apple knows this. I think they're getting really clever with their pricing ladders and they're really leaning into the decoy effect further and further. And I just want people to be aware of it so that you don't fall victim to it. I mean, it's easy for us to get excited for new hardware and new tech and stuff, but the side benefit of there being a lot of decoys is that I think you can also justify buying last year's model, buying certified refurbished, buying not necessarily brand new from Apple because there's so many sales and you can typically find yourself a way to save some money and still get a solid machine. So maybe not necessarily fall for the trap of, I need a 14 inch MacBook Pro, but maybe save yourself some money and go with an M1 MacBook Pro because that'll be cheaper, but still do basically everything that the M2 MacBook Pro is gonna do for you just at a budget. Or maybe since the iPhone 14 and 14 Plus are not that great a deal, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to opt for the 14 Pros. Honestly, I think as cool as Dynamic Island is, it will probably wear off on you and you won't be that impressed by it after a week or two. So that justifies you either keeping your current iPhone for another year, waiting for the 15, or maybe if you're just in dire need of an upgrade, the iPhone 13 is still being sold. And it's honestly not a bad option. It has a lot of similarities with the 14 and it costs a hundred bucks less. And if you're willing to go with the 13 mini, you can save yourself another $100 and still have the same A15 chip that they're putting in the iPhone 14s minus a GPU core and some RAM here and there. But I ultimately don't think that's going to be as big a deal as you think it is. And given the economy right now, I don't think saving some money and realizing I can live with less, I can live with a older iPhone that doesn't have action mode or car crash detection, but it still gets me through the day. I can still stay in contact with everyone I care about. I can take some awesome pictures. So that's why I wanted to highlight the decoy effect for you today is just to encourage you to not fall victim to spending more because you started falling down the pricing ladder of, well, it's only a little bit more. Well, it's only a little bit more. That's a dangerous way of spending. And that's why maybe the Series 8 doesn't excite you that much. It can justify you going with the Series 7 or maybe the new Apple Watch SE, which is a lot cheaper, but is still rocking that car crash detection. So you want to prioritize safety. There you go. I hope that made some sense to you guys. And I hope we can all just try to be a little bit more wise with our spending because it's definitely easy to start disliking all of our money as soon as Apple marketing graces our eyes. But ultimately, it's all just stuff at the end of the day that is useful and functional, but don't take it too much further than just its functions and what works best, not necessarily what looks the prettiest. Let me know your thoughts on Apple's decoy effect down in the comments below. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I'll see you all in the next one.